friends to uh, promote down in the U.S. are Dave Hilton, who has the Conflict Specialist Show. It's a unique web TV show that discusses a whole range of uh, matters related to conflict and mediation. You can access the show at www.conflictshow.com. He has a subscriber um, ability, so each week, you, uh, if you enroll in the subscriber list, you can get an email with the newest show and sent to you right to your direct to your email. Also, the other person to promote is Patty Porter, who's known as the Texas Conflict Coach, and she has a live blog talk radio on Tuesday nights, 8 p.m. Toronto time. You can access that at www.texasconflictcoach.com. Again, uh, very similar to Dave, different format. It's about interviewing and uh, bringing to light about uh, professionals and situations regarding uh, mediation, conflict, conflict coaching, and all related areas of that. So check it out. How are you doing, Brian? I'm all right, thank you. Yourself? A little warm. Yeah? Yeah. Summer can do that to you. Yeah. It, it always does it to me. <laughs> That's okay. I need more whatever. Coolness. You need more coolness? Yeah. I'll touch base with you in six months' time. Well, I, you know, I need it now. Oh, you what, need it now? Yeah, what can you do about it now? <laughs> Sorry. I didn't bring a fan with me. Yeah. <laughs> what can you do? What's, what's new for the last two weeks? Um... I was just thinking on the way in how, uh, if at all possible, uh, I would recommend to everyone that you go with, you try and be optimistic, you know, your cup be half full, not half empty, um, because I was thinking one shortly after I left on that, that Sunday, what I love about doing the radio show is my week starts on Sunday, you know, Sunday, just like the calendar, strangely enough, and, uh, and that was for me an excellent week, but there was one really unfortunate thing that took place um, early later in the week, which I won't uh, I won't go into details. It's a personal matter, but everything else is fantastic. And it's funny how you it happens sometimes, and you just need to be willing to um, to take the positive when it comes and just sort of ride through the negative, because uh, it, it happens for all of us. It, I, and it's interesting. We do the show, and it gives us I think it gives us an excellent tools for um, to progress and and to be able to. Cope, cope almost seems like a too passive a term, but yeah, to be, and, lim and limiting, right? It's exactly just, to be proactive. It. That's it. Yeah, be proactive in your life where at all possible. That's yeah. certainly what we re what we reinforce time and again, and uh, and, and if uh, that's the one thing I take away more every time we come together, and certainly the one thing I would recommend. Um, yeah, and if at all possible, try and stay, uh, try and look to those positives as they take place. If if it's something that's very that doesn't happen in your life, then maybe it's time to make a change in order to, to find those positives. Sometimes people need some assistance. Oh, absolutely. They want to do it. Yet yes. They're not sure how to do it or they just need that, you know, that energy of someone beside them helping them along. Yes. So, you know, that's part of the intention of this show is can act as a catalyst for people to sort of question what's going on in their lives and if they're not satisfied or happy. Okay, so let's what's do step, something about it. Exactly. What steps can they take? Absolutely. Because yeah. at the end of the day, it, it still comes down to you. I, I always say you need to have a just a tiny bit of selfishness in your life and that you, you need to be your number one cheerleader um, because you can't count on anyone, nor, nor should you count on anyone else to be more proactive as to what you need to do. You have to be the one driving your own bus. And yeah. I only say that because I used to be a bus driver. So, so if you ever hear that come out of my mouth several times, because I've been a bus driver, so I'd say, yeah, you've got to be the one to drive your own bus. Right, and especially if there are other people around you who are dependent on you in some form. Even more so. And so you need to be somewhat stable, strong within yourself. Yes. Because otherwise you're giving too much, and too much is being taken away in whatever form, and you end up in a, you're going to burn out. Exactly. So... We did have a, two weeks ago, we did have a challenge that yes. week in terms of the radio. I still but say the, I still say the antenna storm? caught. It was that storm. Yes, the, the I still say the antenna caught lightning, but I mean, we have no proof. So, so <laughs> the, the recording actually, we were off air for about... Um, about 25 minutes. Actually, it just ended only about 12, 13 minutes. Okay. Of technical time. Excellent. Something like that. Even better than I, okay, yeah, good. I so, so, hopefully... That won't happen again, though no. next time if something does happen, a little more knowledge. Yeah. So know what to deal with. And 
we are hoping, I guess we are hoping to bring Robin back. Yes, we haven't figured out. Uh, no worries, it'll be great to see her again. Yeah, our guest tonight knows Robin too. Oh, so sweet. Colleague over at uh, Media 393, which Very is good. part of the program at the uh, Family Courts in Toronto. And uh, that was Robin who was here during that night. She experienced <laughs> the unexpected challenges that we always experience. So uh, let's uh, segue into uh, introducing Jared. Jared yes. Norton's here tonight with us. And we're talking about adolescent and family issues and approaches to mediate. So, how are you doing, Jared? I'm doing great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for uh, being here tonight. Um, how about you share some information about your, uh, your background, especially the professional stuff? Sure. I am a social worker by education. Uh, I did my Master's of Social Work at the University of Toronto. I'm also a accredited family mediator. Um, when I was in school, I, I did my clinical training at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. I was there for about two years. Um, worked in various programs, uh, worked in the adolescent service and did um, Section 34 YCJ assessments. Was involved in the family service and problem gambling, uh, better behavior service for the younger kids, and had um, some work in family psychiatry as well. I spent five years as a operator and um, trainer at the Distress Center of Toronto, and I've worked as an adolescent family therapist in Durham Region. Um, currently, I have a private practice called Empowerment Practices, and I do therapy and family mediation, parenting coordination, and as you mentioned, I'm also involved with Mediate 393 at the courts in Toronto. Right. Yeah, that's uh, particularly at uh, 393 University Avenue at Dundas and Superior Court of Justice of Ontario. Yep, and uh, information referral coordinator there and family mediator. And um, I'm also currently on the clinical panel with the children's lawyer doing assessments. So you're quite busy. Yeah, I try to be. Yeah, I mean, that's makes it, um, you know, our lives more interesting when we can be stimulated that way. And of course, we, if we want to be stimulated that way, Absolutely. I mean, I, I love the work and, uh, you know, it's, it's constantly challenging me and, and forcing me to rethink things and learn more about myself and the people around me, so it's great. Not to be passive, right? To absolutely. constantly question things. Absolutely. Don't take them for granted. No, no, absolutely. There's always something to learn, there's always something to question, so. Yeah, so in, in case anyone uh, wants to give us a call too, they can do so at 416-785-0680. Just uh, let Leah, who's answering the phone, uh, that you want to go to air. You can give a fake name, we'll never know. We don't have that polygraph test that's uh, usually here tonight. So, yeah, so you can fake your voice. Yes. Yeah, whatever works for you. We're, uh, yeah, you can call us from uh, inside a dark closet if that works for you. Yeah, it yeah. might be fun, uh, hard to find the, the, the keyboard, though. Yeah, no, you know, whatever works. We're, we're, we're pretty open. Um, Jared, what are you most curious about regarding people? I'm, you know, I, I'm sort of... Uh, Curious about everything, I'd say. I mean, it, it sounds sort of ridiculous to say, but everything about the human experience um, I find fascinating. Um, you know, everything, our, our behavior, our motivations, how we organize and make sense of our lives, um, you know, both individually and collectively. I'm, I'm really fascinated by interpersonal relationships and, and really how we sort of manage the interworld with the inner world and, you know, how we balance our, our inner needs and, and also sort of balance the needs of, of family members and our intimate partners. And you know, really looking at how we influence the relationships around us and how in, they in turn influence us. So there's an always uh, an active engagement of some form. I mean, doesn't mean everybody's always connected with what's going on around them. Mm -hmm. Though things are constantly happening. There's always a flow, there, and there's always an energy going back and forth. You know, whether you're aware of it or not. So I mean, you can't help but be influenced by things. No one lives in a bubble as, as much as some people may try. Yeah. Well. Yeah, that's true, and I won't say anything further about that. <laughs> what did you decide to focus your professional life on, working with individuals and families? Um, I'll give you a little, a little background on that. I, I guess I was always sort of interested in, in psychology and mental health, and back when I was in high school, which was a long, long time ago, I uh, took a course and, and got really interested in it, and then, oddly enough, through a neighbor, I got an opportunity to be a volunteer at a place called Silver Hill um, Hospital, which was a hospital that focused on psychiatric and addictive disorders, and that was in New Canaan, Connecticut, which is not far from where I grew up. And my involvement there, I sort of had the opportunity to become an athletic coordinator 
and uh, you know I got to meet a lot of the, the patients, the adolescents, and, and work with them. And that really sort of got me interested in issues. I never, you know, being an adolescent at the time, I never really sort of thought of things. But you know, that really got me questioning about who I was and what people my own age were going through. And how long did you stay with that kind of uh, role? I was there for two years, um, and then I left there when I went to university. Um, but it was it was definitely a a really sort of forming stage, and it really I think sort of laid the groundwork for my future career and my. And, you know, a lot of us get involved in. Uh, I mean, the professional work as adults because of circumstances that may have arisen or happened when we were younger. Was, was there anything similar for yourself? Yeah, I, you know, I think around that time, um, I think like all families, my family was going through things. We all experience things in life that are, that are difficult and challenging, and, and you know, families tend to face these head on, and you know, sometimes families talk about them, sometimes they don't. Uh, one of the big things in my family was dealing with transitions. Uh, we moved back. We lived in the States for a long time and moved back, and, and that was hard. And, you know, dealing with family members who had health issues and things. And you got to see people really sort of suffer with that. Um, so I began to sort of realize that, you know, families go through all these things, and sometimes they need a little help and they need people to talk to. And, again, having experienced um, almost like a peer mentoring role when I was working at the hospital, hearing other, other young people and hearing these similar experiences, it really, you know, got me thinking about how, you know, what types of resources were available to young people and families, and, you know, I think that, again, that really sort of piqued my interest as a career. So you made the deliberate and intention that this is the path I'm going to follow and everything that I do education or work-wise is going to sort of fulfill that Cool. Yeah, it was. I mean, I um, when I went to university, I studied psychology first, um, and then you know after I graduated, my intention was always to go into graduate school and eventually be a psychologist. Um, I took a number of years off and uh, became a musician. And you know, what kind of instrument do you play? You got some music? We'd like to play music here once in a while. I'll you know I'll bring a couple of CDs by sometime. Really? You got, you got you got stuff? Yeah, we uh, my brother and I have a twin brother, and we we played in a band. I was a drummer. He was a, a singer. And um, we formed in the early stages of university, uh, and a number of friends, a couple of friends of ours, and we played along for a number of years, did a few albums, and uh, toured around, and played a lot of shows, and it was great. And But of course, you know, it's, it's a very tough career, and uh, I sort of woke up one day, and I was like, this is not going to happen. And I, that's what you think. Now, now we've had this conversation. It's going to blow up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> we do what we can. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, you know, it was, it was... <laughs> <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't think that was going to happen. Like, this is a plan here. We, we really don't want to talk about adolescents and families. Well, we, want, we want to talk about your music career. I'm fine with that, actually. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's all coming back to me now. Really? Yeah. We, we had a chord. Okay. Yeah. That's a good work in music chord. But, but uh, after that, you know, I, I was sort of looking for a direction. And I went back to school. Um, again, I always had this sort of passion for mental health. And I had actually taken a um, conflict resolution class in my psych undergrad. And that really sort of focused on uh, more macro issues. It was sort of community-based mediation and sort of um, looking at international issues and how ADR can be applied to that. Right. Um, and I, I didn't really think about the family application at that time. Um, and I actually sort of went back and did the training in ADR at York and took the advanced family course. And I, I sort of saw this application of the conflict resolu resolution theory to family. And right. you know, in, in combination with my passion for mental health and, and family and adolescence, it just seemed like the natural sort of evolution of thing. And it, it, I felt it would really sort of accompany the other things I wanted to do. Right. So you know, it's like you know, your your passion, right? Yeah, love it. Yeah. What type of uh, issues are the ones that you see as most affecting adolescents, adolescents and families, Jared? Um, you know, it's there, there's so many things I think that affect adolescents. Um, I think the big things, speaking generally, there's, there's mental health issues, um, issues in and around addictions, there's issues around conflict. Um, you know, there's, adolescents are really at this, this crossroads, um, developmentally speaking, where they're at, they're, they're changing, they're evolving, they're, you know, sort of stuck between being a child, sort of right after yeah. the early adolescence, latency age, they're just before adults. Quasi-adults. That, that's it, right? And their brain's developing. It's, it's a very, very tough time. And, you know, for adolescents, I'm, I'm sort of fascinated by their issues because, you know, there's issues in and around now with, with media and, and influenced by, 
you know, things about body image and they face bullying and all this types of stuff. And for me, one of my, my main interests is looking at um, things like video game addiction and technology addiction, which is a huge problem for adolescents, as is gambling. And this, is, this sort of comes out of my, my training at CAMH and became a real big interest for me. Um, you know, and, and really looking at how young people are susceptible to these types of technologies. Mm -hmm. And how they've been influenced. I mean, yeah. just the change in the form of communication from when we were younger oh, to now, it's like, it's so detached, it's impersonal. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things I found when I was doing um, adolescent and family therapy is that the communication styles and the types of information um, that's passed back and forth, it's it's almost hard to understand at times, right? There's there's a lingo, there's a language, there's, there's a short form to the old glossary of uh, new age communication. Yeah, through technology. Yeah, and I imagine you'd find there's um, especially when you're dealing with with adolescents, and then parents come in, or, or the per, or the the parental generation. There's there's a whole different mix in terms of how adults, older adults, communicate versus mm -hmm. adolescents and how they take in information and, and exchange information back and forth and yeah. certainly that's something we've discussed in the past where it's a potential for conflict there mm -hmm. because you might see, feel you're both communicating but you're on different levels and therefore the message isn't getting through. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the other thing I find amazing about adolescents is their, their processing speed and their, their, their ability to, to juggle communication and move. I mean, it's just, it's amazing to watch at times. How, how quickly they adapt and how quickly they pick up new information technology. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So, it's a, at the same time as Brian, you know, the, tr the generational gap that can occur when communicating and whether it's, you know, the message that you're trying to communicate is actually being understood the way you intended it or wanted it to and then, you know, especially with parent-child conflict matters mm -hmm. where Brian and I used to uh, be attached up in uh, Jane Finch area. We did a lot of uh, parent youth mediation. So having, you know, we, we did a co-mediation model, community-based mediation, and we had a, an adult as part of the co-mediation and a youth as part of the co-mediation meeting model. And that would try and facilitate a process of trying to get the, the adult or the parent or parents and also the child the youth who was experiencing matters to, to have a space and voice and the intention too was deliberate in having a younger mediator as part of the, the model so that the youth would feel that there was someone there that they could identify mm -hmm. with and having a sense of voice some form someone who get me someone who knows what I'm going through you know that like the peer model yeah well. I mean it, it feeling that you can relate to someone that you that you're working with and, and talking with is so important you know and that's I think the number one thing from, from my perspective as, as a mediator and, and certainly as a, as a mental health professional and therapist as well is really trying to engage youth in these types of processes and make them feel comfortable and make them feel that their voice is heard because their voices have value and, and you know in, in many times unfortunately in our, in our society their voices aren't heard um, and they're, you know, they're, not, they're not credited with, with their ideas. Yeah, in the sense that maybe you mean uh heard in the sense that they can say them, though it's having a, a way of influencing mm -hmm. decisions that are made about them yeah. in some form. How do you see the practices of counseling and mediation as approaches in working with adolescents and families? Yeah. I, I really see both of them as sort of tools for change. Um, you know, they're both quite different, but to me they're really interventions and tools that can assist you know, individuals, adolescents, or adults, or families get unstuck to, to sort of move forward to address issues that may be sort of keeping them what I would call in a sort of inauthentic way of living, um, something that's preventing them from reaching their, their potential. In terms of counseling, you know, we also had this at uh, the agency that uh, I was working at up in Jane Finch. People, you know, identify mediation with counseling. And always had to give a basic little quick education piece on the distinction that counseling isn't mediation, yeah. though there are similarities. What would you share as being, from your perspective, 
Yeah, I mean, I would, I would absolutely agree that, that mediation is not therapy. Um, it's not counseling. Um, you know, there, there are, as you, as you indicated, there's some very close similarities, um, certainly in terms of, you know, questioning and, and the skills and to some degree, depending on your therapeutic background, the outcomes and how you're, how you're looking at issues. Um, but for me, there's a couple of big differences. One is that for therapy, it's, it's really about the sort of therapeutic relationship and the focus of the issues. Um, you know, that therapeutic relationship, there's a lot of engagement. Uh, I think there's an investment in therapy um, that may not be as present in mediation. I think, you know, how you look at things like neutrality um, and, and role, uh, there's, a, there's an alignment with, ther like with a therapist and, and, a, and a client that you may not have um, with a mediator. And the interventions, I think, are also a bit different. You know, I mean, therapy really focuses on that sort of therapeutic healing whereas mediation is, is a very solution-focused outcome um, that I find, you know, and, and how you, I mean, really how you draw attention to things. There's, there's no pathology really in mediation, whereas, you know, in, in some models of therapy, you're really looking at pathology and, and whatnot. Yeah, it goes into a deeper, distinct area of the human experience. Yeah. And mediation does go, want to go below the surface, because mm -hmm. that's where we find the why is for you know, on the well, people are doing certain things. It's an explanation. It's a context. Yeah. Though we're not looking to uh, help someone deal through the emotional to the same or psychological depths. And you know, for me too, therapy is an open-ended process. Mm -hmm. it's, there's no specific timeline. It's based on an individual and their commitment to it. Mediation is a more short-term process that has specific timelines, basically. As part of its process, it's not an ongoing process. It, it, in, in general, it shouldn't be. Then it becomes somewhat like therapy, yes. which is sort of the whole defeating the process. Because one of the intentions that I see is the practice is that you're trying to give people the tools and the means for mm -hmm. them to be independent, to build their own capacity, so they can do things on their own. I mean, therapy is trying to do that too, but the approach is distinct. Information, yeah, no, knowledge is important. And you know, we, we acquired more information, knowledge tonight. So last week was an issue with some of the technical. The week before was too. Though we've learned from those, and hopefully uh, in, the, in the future, if something was to arise, we have that knowledge to draw upon. Yes. So no technical issues. No. Nope. From a personal standpoint, I always love learning more each, each time I come out. I know I've, t I've joked about it in the past about being sort of the the village idiot guy that comes in and stays and and you know asks the questions and the gee whiz, but uh, well what you come you're on uh, there's, no, there's no marginalizing here. <laughs> That's fine. We're not. Yeah. Uh. No worries, man. No worries. Um, Jared, how do you organize yourself to mediate with family members? Um, you know, the first thing I do is sort of I think what Greg you were just talking about is knowledge. Is I try to get knowledge, I try to get information. Um, with families, you know, there's so many parts, there's so many people, there's so many players at the table. Many of those people aren't even at the, at the table. It's family members who are there, they're kind of present in, in the language, they're present in, in the energy. So I try to really get a good picture of that. Um, you know, in, in therapy, we often do genograms you know, to really map everything out and get a sort of visual and sort of see where everyone's at and get a good sort of picture of the relationship. And I think that's the foundation as well for mediation. Certainly through the intake process, get as much information as you can. Um, you know, for me as, as a practitioner, the other thing that's really important is to sort of, you know, do a check-in with myself. I want to be aware of my own biases. I want to sort of, you know, make sure there's no counter-transference going on. I, you know, look at my own lenses and see how that may contaminate the process. So really sort of ground myself and see where I'm at. You got to be consciously aware, right? Totally yeah. at all times, because it's not only about the the verbal communication; it's also the nonverbal, the body language mm -hmm. that we can present. That we may say one thing orally or verbally, but though we may communicate something differently with our, you know, the way we're positioning, with our hands crossed, mm -hmm. or our facial expressions. Yeah, I mean, you you sort of move your eyes, you roll your eyes the wrong way, you slouch a bit. People interpret that how they want. You can throw the whole thing off the rails. Right. I yeah. found having to. Um, being a, a, a volunteer mediator with our, uh, our organization years, many years ago, one of the uh, aspects that Greg was good about when he taught us is that you do realize it, you, you have to try as much as possible to be a blank slate because mm -hmm. you are there just to get 
the groups to come together to some extent. So it was an excellent learning experience for myself, I found for myself, because it allowed me to realize, yeah, make yourself as passive as possible, as, as transparent as possible, so that you're trying to get them to, to engage. And you, for you, as, a, as a mediator, you gotta leave it at the door. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever, you know, someone stole your parking spots, and whatever else, you know, the paper boy put it through the window again, whatever, it has to go, because your focus is engaging, getting these people to engage, in order to move forward. It's an excellent, excellent, great challenge, but one if you're willing to, to, to meet that challenge, it's, it's very beneficial. Yeah, very hard work, very hard work to leave it at the door. Um, Separate yourself. It's also, you know, from the conversations when you're in mediation, there's things that you as a person, in terms of your other life, would never agree to or participate in or the values are distinct from you. Yet you have to work with people whose values are different from yours, mm -hmm. and not be affected to the point that. And if it does, then you have to be honest and open about. Okay, that's that's going to influence my ability to help you. We have to remain detached, as much as possible. Though at the same time, I think it's important for us to be connected. We have to show some kind of empathy for the individuals going through their struggles. Yeah. So it's a, it's a balancing act that we constantly have to go through. So when you work with adolescents in, in terms of mediation, how do you incorporate, what do you incorporate as part of that practice? Well, I mean, there's a couple of things I would sort of touch on there. I mean, I was sort of talking about engagement there as, as being really the foundation for adolescents. And the thing I find amazing about adolescents is they're, you know, they're really good at sniffing out inauthenticity. They're really, they're really good at calling your bluff. Um, you know, I, I find the amazing thing about adolescents is they don't, they don't tend to fall for that sort of authority trick. You know, they don't... Give, they give don't, an example, just so people can, go, you know, give a, uh, appreciate what you're saying. You know, I, well, here's sort of an example. When, you know, you meet with, with individuals, um, they sort of look at you and they, they see your role and they go, oh, this, this guy must be a, you know, he's a therapist, he's a mediator, he's got some degrees on the wall, he, he, must, he must know what he's talking about. You, you go in, you meet with an adolescent the first time, and they just sort of roll their eyes, and they're like, this guy knows nothing. He big deal, know. big deal. You know, and it's, they, really, they really call you out on it. And it, that's why I love working with them, because it's so challenging. It's so humbling. You know, they knock you down, and they make you work, and you really have to earn it with adolescents. So I think that's, that's the number one thing to incorporate. You go in transparent, you be yourself, and you just, you just do the work. Yeah, be honest and sincere, and then hopefully that will the youth will uh, connect with that, appreciate that, and so much sort of then shift their mindset to sort of be connected to what you're intending to try to do with them. Yeah, I mean, it, they begin to trust you, and that's, that's the most important thing. If they trust you and they're comfortable with you, they're going to listen. They may disagree with you, but they're going to listen to what you have to say, and they're going to work with you. Right, and it's never easy, of course. No. And uh, all youth are different, just like all adults are. And uh, there's no one way of doing things. You know, we have to adapt our model or our approach, our, our mindsets to mm -hmm. incorporating for the individual. Yeah, and that's it. I mean, the other thing too to consider is that you know, when you're when you're working with adolescents, there's there's no one one model, right? There's no one thing, and, and they're all different. They've all got different interests. They've got different views, and you know, when they realize that you're privileging those views and you're accepting them for who they are and what they have to say, that goes, that goes a long way. And, and the, what they have to say and who they are is actually may, is important. Mm -hmm. And you're not trying to minimize them or marginalize them just because, quote, they are a younger person. They sh and their sense in the past may have been that they're not getting the recognition, they're not being acknowledged for mm -hmm. having a way to really s speak to who they are. Yeah. Jared, what can happen with an adolescence with, when the family unit becomes vulnerable to separation and possibly divorce? You know, again, there, there's any number of, of outcomes. You know, with, with all young people, it's, you, know, you tend to see different things at different ages. I find you know, you're going to see different things from really young children to the sort of you know, latency age to later latency age into the early adolescence. But you, know, you do see certain things, and you know, Again, it's also going to depend on individual characteristics. Temperament plays a big factor. Um, someone's resiliency and the risks and protective factors that they may have in their in their home and their environment. 
Um, but you're going to see things likely like you know anger and, and, and grief, any sort of normal responses that anyone's going to have to these types of difficult situations. You, know, you may even see things like uh, no response, which is which is equally as as troubling when you see people who don't react. You, you mean in the sense that the show some emotion, they they look fine. You know, and that that's one of the, the biggest worries that I always have is when when someone just looks perfectly okay on the with surface everything. on the surface yeah I mean sometimes it's it's I think it's healthy to to look like you're a little bit frazzled you know to let go and, and sort of experience these negative things and and you know when you're an adolescent you're going to do things like gravitate towards peer groups maybe experiment a bit with some risky behavior those are all normal things and those might show up a little bit more when they're experiencing these types of transitions when you see nothing that's also a big Big word. That's a that's also a, a red flag too. Oh yeah, yeah. And you know, someone is disconnected or not connecting with the experiences that are fundamental to their everyday living, mm -hmm. and that would be a, a cue for us to say, hey. Though you got to watch how you approach, right? Because mm -hmm. if someone's not expressing anything outwardly, and you just go there, they just say, oh nothing. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's there's no there's no easy answer. It's a balancing act, right? Like you gotta, you, as you said, you gotta approach, you, you gotta approach carefully, you know, and, and be really mindful of how you phrase your questions and how you how you talk about these issues. So, how do you feel about your uh, decision to uh, become a mediator? I I feel great about it. I uh, I love it. I I love the work. Um, you know, it's it's such a unique thing, and and I think that's you know. It's different than therapy, as, as we sort of talked about, and it's it's a very different role. And I, I like I like the the role itself. I like how I get to interact with the parties. I like how the dialogue shifts and flows. It's it's a really sort of unique experience as a professional. So you know, very happy that I went into it. And do you have any ideas of you know any further changes as part of your professional life? Um, I don't know. I mean, there's, as I said, there's, there's a number of things that, that I'm doing, um, yeah. and it, it sort of keeps me balanced. You know, I, I, I love therapy. I think that's sort of my, my passion, working with adolescents and families um, and individuals. Um, but I, I do love mediation. Um, I'm getting into parenting coordination now, which I'm really, really excited about. And I love doing the work with the children's lawyer. So it's, it, they're all very different. Right. Um, and I think for me, it it's really sort of keeps me entertained. You know, keeps me from from not getting burned out, which is great. Well, you know, keeps just, you're obviously somebody who needs that change, yeah, like energy of change, creativity. You know, variety is important. Diversity is important mm -hmm. for you. I I connect with that too. I mean, I do different things, and I feel I have to do different things because I get uh, a different level of energy from each kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And if I was doing the same thing, I'd just get into a I wouldn't say complacency, but a sense that you know I'm not utilizing what I have the best way. Mm -hmm. So it's it's always a matter of challenging ourselves with new pieces and new experiences, making ourselves vulnerable. Which is which is incredibly difficult. You know, most people don't like being vulnerable at all. Uh, I mean, all right? Yeah, you know, that's true. You know, people don't like change. Yep. In my experience, so it's it, it's hard to take risks. It really is, but it's it's rewarding. I find in the end. And that's why I identify as a transformation consultant, you know, the whole thing of change, transformation. Change is ever-present, constant in mm -hmm. our lives. It's, it's going to happen regardless of whether we want it to or not. It's a matter of us being interjecting ourselves and getting connected with the moments as they go through us so that we can influence those aspects that contact us. And instead of things happening to us, we can have a contribution as part of the changes that will happen. Well, there's also the feel-good factor of knowing that um, you are helping people, where possible, move forward in their lives to some extent by dealing with the conflict, dealing with the challenge, dealing with um, whatever issues they may have. Um, and that's one of the aspects that I think is, is really um, uh, invigorating, is, is that you are helping to a certain extent. It's not all on you. Um, it's not all on them. But it's it's finding that sort of sort of bridging that gap between the issue they may have and the potential for solution, mm -hmm. and knowing that um, you're shepherding to some to a certain extent, and then standing back and letting them t 
take over um, take over their lives again, and in, 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 at least in dealing with that particular issue. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think being able to connect with people and, and contribute in a positive way. Um, you know, the, the best thing I find about certainly from my theoretical perspective about things like mediation and, and my approach to therapy is that they really direct it, and I'm I'm there to just sort of you know offer my my quote unquote expertise, my training, my background to really help them move forward. And if I can do that in any little way, I, it, it is it's a great experience to be part of that. Yeah, and we're we're there to help support and assist individuals through their journey of change, yeah. and they have ownership of their own contribution, their commitment to the, the, their contribution, and their commitment to following through with whatever decisions they're going to make as part of a process. Because we don't want to become codependents with them, mm -hmm. and we don't want it so that uh, every time something happens, they have to contact us. You know, people build their own capacities, their skill sets, so they can deal with things on their own. I believe in that, though I've always a little model of trying to be like mediator on call. In community mediation, we always want to have this mediator mobile. People dial a number, and we come on over, yep. and we'd uh, help them in the moment with our mediator mobile and community mediation, and then move on. That's a great idea. <laughs> in terms sure. of uh, the dynamic, what's necessary for people to factor in as part of dealing with uh, issues in the family? Well, what, I, what should they should be aware of? I think, as you just said, dynamic. That's it. Family dynamics, I think a good understanding of that is, is absolutely key. Um, families are, are so complex, and they're so complicated. And you know, you see a family, and, and what you often don't see is, is the generational issues, um, the way in which information and stories and narrative are passed down, and how that impacts behavior and all the different components. So I think understanding how families work, how um, you know re relationships form, and how things like allegiances form. You know, often in, in therapy and, and mediation, you hear people talk about things like um, you know enmeshment and scapegoating, all these types of things, which talk about relationships. You know, are relationships too close? Or are they are they too far apart? Understanding that, I think, you know, is, is the foundation of family work. I mean, what's a healthy relationship? Well, <laughs> you know, that's that's a great question. I don't I don't know that one could really come up with a definition for that. I think we have an understanding of traits or things that may you know indicate a healthy relationship, but it depends on the parties. I mean, for one context, one dynamic, this is maybe determined as healthy. Yeah. You put the same thing on another family dynamic, it, it might be dysfunctional. Absolutely, and you know, I think that's one of the problems from my perspective. I'm a bit, a bit critical, I think, sort of my educational background, I'm a bit critical of things, um, you know, the way in which we pathologize people and, you know, we say one thing is bad, one thing is good. You know, it's, it's a discourse, and you know, what we might say as, as a therapist, a professional is bad or, or problematic for a family, mm -hmm. might not be. You know, and that's really why their their individual perspective, their own insider knowledge as a family is so important to get. Right. You know, the traditional view is to compartmentalize and box people into these confining spaces that have predeterminations and that's how we're then it's supposed to treat them according to quote theory and the models like that. Mm -hmm. Life is unexpected and organic. Yeah. And you never know what you're going to come up with. Yeah. And once you put someone in that mold, I mean, my experience is it backfires. People reject those notions, especially adolescents. You know, you go in, if you're working with an adolescent, you say, oh, you have this diagnosis, you have that diagnosis, you're a problem child. They get really upset, and rightfully so. I wouldn't want to be told that. You know, I, and I think that's the great thing about mediation, is you approach issues with the understanding that conflict is normal, that these things are normal, you're not pathologizing anyone. And that way people feel, they feel better Right? And they, they, they're able to tackle issues in a much different way rather than internalizing these things as their own problem. Yeah, like, well, there's a right and wrong here. Mm -hmm. There's differences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What type of impact is taking place for you from focusing your efforts on working with adolescents and families, John? I, you know, the impact is, it, I think it's made me better all around as a professional. Um, you know, they, again, it's a challenging factor. They, they challenge me, they make you think. Um, it's, it's been a humbling experience. Um, you know, I, I think one of the big things for me is it's allowed me to to reflect on my own upbringing um, and sort of recognize um, the, the great positive things in, in my family environment, things that really gave me um, advantages that maybe other people didn't have, um, and then be mindful of the struggles that people go through. I think I'm more appreciative of 
sort of, you know, issues outside the family, which direct family behavior, you know. So it's really altered my whole perspective on people, relationships, and lives. And how do people uh, approach you, uh, the ones that are closest to you? Are they leery of coming closer to you? Uh, you're sort of, are you uh, trying to put me in a box here? Yeah. Or you talk differently now that you're in mediation. I, you know, I, I mean, I think it's inevitable that people are going to joke about that. You know, is it true? I don't, maybe it is. Um, but I, I think you do. I think you do begin to talk differently. I, I've heard a lot of people who I'm close to, you know, say, you know, you're talking like a therapist, you're talking like a mediator, and it's true. I mean, you try to incorporate those things because they are great tools. They're great communication tools, and it allows you, I think, to connect with people on a, on a really positive level and get the message across and really hear them as well. So walk the talk. Absolutely. Right? You know, be true to yourself. Though. And you got to you got to practice it. It's hard work. You know, it's hard work being able to communicate like that. So what suggestions can you share for people to be aware of and uh, some steps to take as part of, you know, the challenges, the experiences of adolescents and families? You know, I, I think the number one thing is for parents to talk with their children. Um, you know, it, I think it's something that often doesn't happen. Uh, life is busy and, you know, it, it, it's hard to, to make the time. Like, I, I get it. Um, but really sitting down and, and talking in a sort of non-confrontational, non-judgmental way find out about them, be curious, ask them questions. I mean, you're going to think as, as a parent often of an adolescent that they're crazy. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's a challenge, yeah. you know, and, but you got to sit down and, and just sort of say, hey, you know, what's, what's going on? Really have those, those conversations. Though, you know, what if a parent, though, is going through their own struggles? How are they going to take that level to them? If they're not taking care of themselves, mm -hmm. how are they going to try to take care of others? You know, it, it's very hard. I mean, you know, one of the things in, in all lines of work that we try to suggest is self-care. Um, you know, you have to be sort of be mindful of where you're at. You have to do your own work, get prepared. Um, that's, to me, one of the biggest challenges as a parent is, you know, having that reserve tank to be able to address on a different level adolescent issues, issues with your family that, you know, you got you to just find that energy. It's, it's very, very hard. Yeah, and I, I would think, too, that it's... If you're, you're not feeling comfortable or capable of doing it yourself, mm -hmm. reach out. Absolutely. Get others. Well, before the last question, I was, what I was thinking is um, this is good prep for me because my boys are still young, single digits. So um, no one can come back to me years from now and say that the, I wasn't uh, well, made well aware because I had this night with Jared. So I should know to, to prep now so that when the time comes and they are struggling to be individuals much more than they are now that I, I realize that yeah I take that tiny tiny percentage of myself set it aside so that I can deal with adolescence in the in the family and not go crazy and understand that the issues try to see the world through their lens it still sounds like parenting 101 but it's never a bad idea to to come back in touch with it from time to time yeah I mean don't don't ever let anyone try to tell you it's easy <laughs> you know, I mean, I think parents often get down on themselves, you know, and I think not, not, should not happen. It, it's so hard, you know, it, it's so difficult, and parents also need to cut themselves some slack, you know. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jared. Um, so, last question. Are there any resources that you can suggest for listeners to assist them with issues within their family? There, are, there's a lot of great resources in the Toronto area. I mean, certainly the Center for Addiction Mental Health offers a lot of programming. Um, the Canadian Mental Health Association does a lot of work with adolescents, and they've also got a great um, program for that sort of transitional youth age, which is that sort of 18 to 24. I think there's historically there's been a big sort of gap in, in service provision for that age group. Um, so they do a lot of work there, and, and so does CAMH as well. They've got services for that age. Um, you know, there's all sorts of youth services available, um, certainly for mental health and therapy and, and family-related work, Family Services Toronto. And then there's a range of, of mediation options as well. And I think sort of, as Greg, you were saying, you know, even if you've got just a little bit of a problem or you're struggling, you got questions, reach out. You know, there's so many options for families. Yeah, and, and people, a resource that's right at their fingertips mm -hmm. is uh, the uh, Toronto 311. You know, just just uh, do, uh, it's 211, sorry, 211toronto.ca on the web. Mm -hmm. Or just take the phone and do 211. And that'll give you access to uh, a huge database, operators 24 hours a day, 24 hours a day, yeah, you know, various languages. And if you need a service, 
you just uh, ask them, I, you know, I'm going through this, and they'll ask you what area of the city, and you can go through getting access to anything. So that's a, another tool as well. So uh, how do you feel? Feeling good. Yeah. You want to do another hour? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to bump the <laughs> next guy up. We'll check with Mario. Well, we can, we can keep the seats, and we won't let them have the seats. <laughs> now, thanks very much for coming out tonight. Appreciate that. It was very informative. Thank you. It was, it was great being here. Thank you both. That was awesome. And we're, we're going to follow up about the music thing, too. Yes. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll come back. We'll talk about that a bit mm -hmm. further. Yeah, yeah. So people out there will be listening for those. Uh, what was the name of the group? The original? Maverick. And then the, you... The Quarrel. The Quarrel. The Quarrel. Yeah. Yeah, the next the uh, next version will be called Resolution. Right? I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, right on. Okay, thanks very much for uh, doing the boards, Leah. Appreciate it. Thank you, Brian J. Oh, always a pleasure. Get to bed, boys. Daddy's coming home. All right. So have a good night and a good week, and we'll see you next week. See you sometime, Mom and Daisy.